Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sackness Native Initiatives webinar featuring Dr. Anna Scott, who will be giving the presentation, Broader Impacts, the Art and Science of Genetic Reflections. My name is Dr. Daryl Monto, and I am the Sackness Native Initiatives Manager. I am an enrolled member of the Kiowa Tribe of Oklahoma and also of Apache and Comanche descent. Uh, we are so glad that you, that you joined us here today. Um, this is gonna be an amazing webinar and I'm so excited uh, to uh, be able to receive this information and share it with all of you as well. Uh, two things I wanna mention before we continue. First, congratulations to all our Sacnistas who are being recognized and graduating uh, this spring semester. We are so proud of you and wish you well in your future endeavors. And also today, May 5th, is the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Native Women and Girls. I appreciate the efforts of the many volunteers, advocates, tribal nations, and organizations who have brought national attention to this crisis and who continue to fight for justice in helping to bring our sisters home. If you are interested in learning more, I suggest visiting the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center online at niwrc.org. I want to take a brief moment to welcome our first time attendees to SACNIS. We are a fully inclusive organization dedicated to achieving true diversity in STEM, where the field, including leadership positions, reflects the demographics of the population. As the nation's largest multicultural and multidisciplinary STEM diversity organization in the country, SACNIS creates space where all members, volunteers, and partners feel they belong and can embrace their intersectional identities. If you are not yet, we invite you to join SACNIS as a member. We have a few housekeeping rules to review. Um, if you have any questions throughout the panel portion of this webinar, we ask that you wait till the end of the presentation and you can submit your questions via the chat uh, feature or the Q&A feature. And we will answer as many questions as we can. Uh, remember to always be polite and respectful to others with your comments. If you have any additional questions that we don't get to, please stay to the end of the webinar to see how you can continue the conversation in the SACNES online community. And with that today, I would like to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Anna Scott. Uh, let me stop my share here and let her get ready. Um, so Dr. Scott is a geneticist, artist, author, and winner of the prestigious Presidential Early Career Awards for Scientists and Engineers. Her lab seeks to understand the molecular mechanisms that underlie cell division during embryonic development using the nematoid. C. elegans as a model system. Failures in cell division often lead to birth defects, cancer, and age-related neurodegenerative diseases. Understanding how cells divide is highly dependent in a vivo microscopy and large amounts of visual data, which dovetails perfectly with one of her passions, art. She has served as a board member for SACNIS and currently serves on the ASCB Minority Affairs Committee. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Anna and she can share more about her and get going with her presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm excited that you're here. Um, and so I'm going to tell you, um, going to tell you a little story about the path in, in my life that I've taken in my career and especially how I've included that in, into my academic career as a faculty member. And for those of you who are grad students, postdocs, or even undergrads, and new faculty, if you're interested in writing NSF Broader Impacts, I hope this might inspire you or kind of think about where you can go with some of your own passions. Um, and then we can talk about that later at the end. So I'm going to tell you about the process of getting to this science art project called Genetic Reflections, um, which is the, my latest NSF grant. And so to tell you a little bit about my background and as a geneticist, I like to talk about my genetics. So I haven't met all of you and I wanna introduce myself and sort of the thought process that goes into the projects that I'm working on here. So as a geneticist, I will share you something you might be familiar with, with which is my pedigree, which is a pedigree. So my father um, was a sculptor and a metal, medical illustrator and also taught anatomy to uh, medical students, which is a little unusual for maybe some people. To me, it was very normal. 
my father is of Ukrainian descent and then my mother was, was a ceramist and an art educator. She's of Lebanese and Eastern Band Cherokee descent. And here's a recent photo I found of my mother and me when I was born in 1972. Um, they, gave, they got together and obviously had, they had children and I'm the oldest of four. And so um, at your first glance, if the first thing that might step out to you because you realize there's only one scientist in here amongst my siblings, is that I might have inherited the recessive gene for science. However, what's happening here is I inherited, a, we all inherited of a obsessive amount of creative problem solving. And so creative problem solving involves art, science, uh, math, lots of things, um, as you may know. Um, and a lot of, and a, there may be reasons why I ended up a scientist. And I like to joke about this as my dad's actually official name is microscope. And so I ended up a cell biologist. So maybe that's how you end up as a cell biologist. You have a dad's, your father's name is microscope. Um, so that's my family. And I grew up in a very eclectic household. And this is a picture of my basement studio where my dad worked. And my dad is doing a bust of his football coach. So my dad played for Syracuse. An unusual thing, an artist playing football. But back in the days of the 50s, a lot of people played who were artists also played football. My dad's doing the bust of his coach. His coach, his name's Ben Schwartzwalder, is was in the F Football Hall of Fame. And he is also the coach um, of a Heisman Trophy winner, Ernie Davis, who is here, came after my father. Um, and so um, if you know anything about science and you look around to my environment growing up, that um, nothing here is sterile. It's very dirty and quite a bit of a mess. Um, and so if you imagine me coming into a science environment. This was a science environment was very new to me. Um, my, my mother was a ceramist, but she also painted, does, does fabrics. Here's just an example, one of my favorite um, paintings that my mom did um, that I would like to share with you. She did this in kind of the late 60s. Um, and here I am, and my, my dad had an art school at, at, in our house, and here's my mom, and here I am at two years old. So my, lots of students came all over the world to study with my father, and they're Today, some of them are, she's an actress. She's a chair of a department of ceramics. There are lots of artists. These are, he's an art dealer in Los Angeles. Very unusual uh, people and interesting people. I thought these were my brothers and sisters. So it was this, there was no, our doors were always open for students, uh, people in need of help. And my parents were always welcoming um, to them. So this was, this was my family growing up. And through the years, you know, I got crazier and crazier and I, here I am not liking to wear any clothes here. Um, and then my sisters are being born and my brother's not born yet. And so this is the eclectic look in 1976. Um, in, when I left for college, my dad, um, so this is a, a view to my backyard. We had about seven acres and we only, we ate off the land and we only bought meat from the store. And so we, we grew everything that we had here. My dad always learned, loved, learn how to do anything like that. He also made this rose garden for my mother and in there he put quotes. And he, before I left for college, he took me out to this stone here that he drew in this quote from Picasso. And he said, every child is an artist and the problem is how to remain one when you grow up. And what my dad was telling me when I realized you know, after I got to college, what actually this meant. My dad told me, don't forget who you are. Um, and re remember this environment in which you grew up, remember this artist lifestyle. And so for me personally, the things that I'm going to share with you today are part of my life. It's part of my genetics. And, and, and the great thing about it, I'm at an institution that I'm allowed to be myself and allow this side of me um, to um, be revealed and, and also to be, make an impact on people, particularly how important the beauty uh, of science actually is. So what else happened in graduate school? So one thing that I'll share with you in grad school was um, I learned that I didn't like these DNA gels so much. I didn't see this was actual biology. I kind of still find it very esoteric, but what I found is that I started doing movies of my, my um, the first events of mitosis and the early embryo of C. elegans. I really fell in love with this. This is something I love looking at all the time. Um, and um, several years later, it dawned on me why I was really drawn to mitosis. 
um, it was because that my favorite artist actually was Moreau. So I didn't, and if you can notice this Moreau, this looks like a nucleus to me. These are kind of centrosomes and microtubules that are holding this up. And so Moreau to me is one of the most biological artists out there. Certainly Picasso has that too. And so I really enjoy Spanish artists a lot um, for this reason. Um, and it, I was drawn to the science through the visual and I wouldn't be in science if it wasn't for the things that I do visually. Um, so I still work on the process of mitosis today, particularly this structure called the midbody. And if you're interested in it, this is sort of my claim to fame. And so I have done proteomics and genomics on this. Um, I'm not gonna tell you about that today, but to, just to tell you that I grew up in this household of artists and then I was drawn to this event. And so once I got to this event, I realized I knew how to do art shows as a kid why aren't people sharing this? And so this was probably mid 1994, I joined graduate school. By the time I started making these movies in 95, 97, I kind of looked around and I was kind of surprised that no one was sharing this. It's terribly beautiful. When I showed my parents, they almost, I think my dad fell over in his chair, he couldn't believe it. He's like, wow, this is the most remarkable thing. And people weren't sharing it at that time. So I thought, why don't we start to share this? And so, um, I asked my mentor at that time to see if I can do sort of shows. So I'm going to kind of show you this organic movement through my career of what happened here. So I started, um, and then as it became a faculty, things kind of changed. So when I was a grad student, I started doing, doing the logos for the International C. Elegans meeting. These are some examples of ones I've done. This was my first one, which is still the most famous one. And to date, I have never paid for a registration of a meeting. I always do the art. So if you're an artist and doing these things, you get a lot of cutbacks for doing this. My lab has saved money because I kind of do logos and do things for the community um, as a whole. Um, so I did this as a graduate student. And then in 97, I started the Worm Art Show, which is still ongoing. I'm doing one this summer. And I had even members of my own lab say I was making a big mistake, but it turned out that when I went on the job market, people found this of value. And certainly they realized that the NSF funds this broader impacts kind of work that I was doing. And so they had some, some notoriety there. In addition, I was very honored when Nobel laureate Sidney Brenner died is that myself and this art show made the Forbes magazine and several news aspects is that this art show that we've had in the community created an immense amount of community and, and a sense of humor within our, in our society. And, and that's what's drawn a lot of people to the C. elegance um, for that matter. And so that was quite an honor there that I was part of creating that immense community that Sidney Brenner had started and created. So um, just an overview of what happens at the C. elegance meeting. They, we, they are, it's very organic. We have poster, we have these art, everyone brings their own art and posts it on, on poster boards and very tough competition here. Susan Strom is a National Academy member. She, lots of faculty enter this and junior faculty and, and, and what have you. And so we, we love, I love the fact that it's very organic and can happen anywhere. So it's not, it's not really formalized. We just make space for it. And then we have, we vote and when we have an, have an award ceremony. And so I'm just gonna show you some examples of some of the art that gets submitted. Here's the one you could see. So Barsha Singh is assistant professor at the Indian in Institute of Science in Bangalore. Absolutely gorgeous watercolor of um, olfaction. He works on olfaction. Um, here's another um, hand uh, sort of pen drawing by Annabelle Ebbing. Um, people also decorate their lab coats. So Greta Sten has had done this beautiful lab coat. Um, here's something that I do. I, I like to be inspired by Moreau. If you don't know this famous uh, painting by Moreau, this is what it looks like, and this is what I've done with it. So I kind of get kind of get playful of, about taking old artworks and kind of doing um, something like this, so people kind of get a sense of my, my passion for Spanish artists here. So, um, and we also do kind of themes every year. And in 2019, the we had a theme. I got really interested in Banksy and public you know, sort of public art. And so this um, Philippe Dexheimer, who just graduated, got his PhD this year, um, actually did this, uh, the first ever world's largest model organism graffiti, which was in Vienna. This launched him, it, this be, went viral on Twitter and this launched his kind of side hustle. He now does kind of graffiti art in a lot of institutes around Europe. And so it's been very awesome to see young artists 
up and coming and kind of um, have a platform for, for people to find them and recognize them. And I, actually a lot of actually C. Elegans faculty will buy other students work and they have it framed on their wall. So a lot of stuff is happening at these meetings and it's kind of very exciting. So that's one, um, that's, that's the initial aspect of something that's been ongoing that I've been doing. I also want to share with you some of the shows and installations that led to this also genetic um, reflections piece that I'm going to tell you about. So when I came to Madison, there was an empty wall here and I didn't want to, I didn't want to uh, work here because it was just a plain wall. So I walked up to the Dean's office and I proposed this idea and they gave me 15,000 to do this installation. Basically very little work is blowing up larger than life um, images from our department. And so from this, I became a member of the art department because I have now a massive installation in a, in a, in a, in a public building. Um, that was exciting because it led to a lot of other collaborations and also allowed me to mentor artists in my lab. Um, now, this, this is an entry where busloads of kids come in um, from around the state of Wisconsin to our Biotrek, which is another NSF funded program that uh, teaches students about DNA and evolution. Um, and then they take it back to their schools around the state. And so this has kind of been a nice uh, entryway and the, the visual starts them off on their path into the building on learning about DNA and learning how, how about things work. So from that, the collaboration with the art department and artists and it turned out the chancellor at the time donated $8,000 to get a lot of images from campus in these display cases at the Madison airport. And so this was initially called the Tiny Show. It got lots of press. Um, it ended up several times, I don't have here, it ended up in Smithsonian Magazine of, about the art every year. We're doing one this year. Um, and just to highlight the beautiful art coming from campus. What, what the impacts that came from this is we left kind of a, a bowl with a little comment box. It was the most popular show they've ever had in the airport. So there, these displays, the display cases are always there. And what, when we started to read some of these notes, what was really kind of surprising, maybe not so surprising today, is that people were very, like they wanted more. They wanted to see more of these things. They were very curious about what stem cells look like. Very curious about obviously fruit flies, things that eat your bananas. What do they really look like? How beautiful they are. Um, and this beautiful thing, which is a trichome on the underleaf of plants is, is things that maybe look kind of scary blown up are really kind of harmless when they're, you know, obviously uh, micron size. Um, and so from that, we got sponsorship from Promega, the art department and the I Research Institute of which I'm a part of to do this thing called the Cool Science I Image Competition with our campus communication um, people. And so, I'll just share with you some of these beautiful images here. And so 2018, they kind of had a similar um, kind of hue and, and, and uh, in, uh, color here. And tungsten was clearly the grand prize winner. It's absolutely gorgeous. And the chemist won this year. In 2019, get a little more colorful. Um, here's a cross section of the corn grain. The barnacle kind of looks like a watercolor. And this was the grand prize winner this year. Um, it's iron ore and hematite. And since I can't see any of you, I usually make people guess of what they think this is. But one of the things that, that as the committee of both scientists and artists that are selecting these, one of the key kind of recipes for really effective science communication and visual is something that looks like something they've already seen before. So if you can kind of think about that in your head, what do you think this is? Probably the first thing that stands out to you is it reminds you probably of Gustav Klimt's kiss, right? So. So the, those are really effective things that work really well because it reminds them of something they know and then it makes them curious. And so we kind of think about that when we select the images and they're, they're kind of sort of broad and impactful in that way. Um, here's another one, uh, probably my most favorite that has ever come out of this thing came actually from my own department and a very good friend of mine, Aki Ikeda's lab. And so he works on aging um, but you could, and I think most of you are probably thinking in your head, what it, you know, probably what it looks like, but in the body, you have to think about where in the, where in your own body does this coming from? Yes, it looks like a Monet. Thank you, Shireen. And so that's what you should be thinking, right? 
but that if in the chat, if you'd like to mention what do you where what part of your body you think this comes from? Just take a guess and you can put it in the chat. Where in your body you think this comes from? Does anyone see any structures here that looks familiar? A gut, maybe? Skin, epithelium, colon. All right, I like these, I like these uh, answers here, but I'm gonna surprise you is that this is actually the a cross section of the back of your eye. It's actually in your retina. So there's blood vessels coming in here, which I'm pointing at here. And so uh, when I talk about, about this image with young kids and groups in particular in public, they come away with this as very excited because they're kind of surprised that there's a Monet or a Van Gogh in their eyeball, right? And that kind of imagery is exactly what I want to get the kids and the public excited about science is that you can discover Monets and Van Goghs in your body and in other species and certainly inside the cell. And that's the excitement that, bring, that I love about science is I never know what I'm gonna to expect to see. And I'm always going to see something as beautiful as a Monet and a Van Gogh. So I kind of pulled up some of these things that kind of look similar to me. A Monet, Van Gogh kind of mash up, I think even more beautiful. So from, from these shows and all these things I've done and became a part of the art department, I started collaborating with artists in my laboratory. And my first um, student that came to my lab was an undergraduate, Chanel is actually still a professional performance artist and, she, and costume designer. She had a Guggenheim Fellowship, which was a very big deal for artists called Differentiate. She came to my lab and was looking at um, GFP images of the nematode and she got really interested in the, the skin of the, the nematode and this is what it looks like beautifully. And she made fabric that kind of reflects on what she was seeing there. And she did a whole performance piece and she still uses these fabrics in her performances. So you can follow her and go see her. So Chanel was really an amazing part of my lab initially starting it out. She just wanted to collaborate with an, a scientist and, and sort of gain experience. And she came to lab meeting and all these things that we normally do as scientists, but she knew how to do Illustrator and she made impacts on all of my science grad students at that time. So I always have these um, people in my lab and they've been very helpful about allowing my lab and scientists think about things in different ways. From that, I was able now to also train uh, art students. So this is my very first uh, master in, in, in the fine arts. Angela Johnson was a high school art teacher um, who worked in museums and then came back to get her MFA. And so she did a show on that we installed on the second floor outside of my lab called Translation. And so she spent time with my lab, the zebrafish lab, mouse lab, and um, and the fly lab on the floor and she kind of got inspired by doing just kind of worms and zebrafish at that time and so she came up as a photographer how to she learned how to kind of antique um, old photographs and you can kind of see that here it's kind of like the old and new right so this it's not exactly very literal science but it has a science take on it it's got a montage that you would see in a journal for example but but a new take on it and it's mounted on these wood to give you kind of this 3D effect, which I really, really love. And I'm gonna show you around kind of the hallway and um, I'll show you a little movie. Another really awesome thing she did with bacteria that the worms eat in my lab is she came with this absolutely innovative way of mounting her images. She used giant kind of, they look like giant microscope slides where she's mounting these images she took from bacteria where we, she dumped pigments onto the bacteria and let it overgrow and watch what happened with the worms. And I'm just gonna zoom in on that so you can see it maybe a little better via zoom. And so she kind of, um, it, it's not, it's E. coli, but it's colored and, and, and it's also a little bit dried out. It kind of looks like topographic maps, a little different. But I think the really innovation to me that came out of this collaboration is the fact the way she was mounting these pieces were kind of remarkable. And I think having that kind of view really just made me think in different ways. Another thing she did is build this, this uh, uh, cabinet of curiosity. And so she took the tracks of the worms and etched, etched it in wood on the outside of this box. And then inside, there's a little keyhole here. So she rummaged around and got a little old keyhole. And I'm gonna show you the movie of this so you can see 
um, what's inside. So she was gonna show the worm development and worms crawling around inside this. So um, this is a movie from the opening night and kind of video. We always have a videographer and it's an undergraduate that's learning how to do document documentaries. And so they gain experience about how to communicate science through the, through the visual and the video. And so I'm gonna show you the video of this. And so this is translation, the movie. It's just music here and there's no talking. So it's kind of another take on a microscope looking through the keyhole. So it's in Angela's interpretation of discovering something new, certainly. So now I'm gonna take you to the highlight of this talk here is talking about genetic reflections. And so, and I'm gonna walk you through the whole process about how it came about. And I had to tell you the story prior to this to get you here to know where this is going. And so I, after I did that show, I was, came the head of the biotech center in, in Madison came to me and said, hey, we got this 40 foot wall, can you fill it? And so for the scientists, this is kind of a massive project. Um, and, and the goal here was the busload of kids come in to learn about DNA down in our teaching labs here. Um, certainly these will be removed that these were part of our department, but the fact that we'd have to create something to teach about DNA, stem cells, maybe the model organisms going on in campus um, to do that. So I enlisted Angela, but I came up with kind of after learning and getting inspired by what Angela can do with the photograph. She also learned how to etch things. She also learned how to silk screen. So with that in mind, um, I went to my brother. So my brother, this is not a photograph. This is actually an image drawn in CAD by my brother. He's very talented is what he does for a business. And so I came up with this idea is that I had to fill this wall. And what I thought, well, we'll recreate circles that look like Petri plates maybe, and that we would either um, laser etch or we would silk screen images of stem cells or DNA or, or genetic code. That was kind of the concept. The first time I submitted my grant, I didn't have this image in and I had to revise it. I didn't get it funded the first time, but the second time around, I, I put this in to visualize what we were doing. And, my, and I didn't know at that time, amazingly at this point in my career, I should have known this is that the part, the broader impacts part of your NSF, you can have a maximum of $50,000 for whatever broader impacts you're gonna do. I didn't realize that. So they called me up and said, Anna, where is your budget for this? And I didn't realize that I didn't have it, you know, there, I didn't know I could put that much. So they said, if you put 50,000 in your grant, we'll fund your science. And that was, it actually took three weeks to try to add money back to my grant and my, from my, um, in on my campus to try to do this with budgeting, but obviously I got it. And the cool thing about that, not only did they add 50,000, they added another 180,000 initially got cut they added my budget back. And so my art has always kind of helped bolster my science funding certainly, and it really helped out a lot. And this 50,000, some of it went to pay for four months of salary for the artist, for Angela, um, and the rest went to supplies and then also a, a traveling piece. So NSF requires that you can't install something that's permanent in a space without some kind of traveling component because it's federal money. And so keep that in mind if you're thinking about things like this is that things have to, the word traveling 
in something. And so I'll show you what the traveling piece looks like and I'll show you what else we did to try to disseminate it further. And so the approach to this concept was that was the initial mock-up, but what happens is we talk to building people and it would have cost us another 50,000 to reinforce the wall because we what we're doing is actually using glass and mirror mounted on onto the wall. And so we had to come up with a way of reinforcing it and we're and Angela's husband is a woodworker and so we came up with using local wood from Wisconsin is that we would use that to mount this piece on the wall. And so we had to work with 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 physical plant people, we had to go through weekly meetings, lots of test samples. So part of that 50,000 pays for glass that's not used and, and mock-ups and all these other things, just like you would probably see like a an architect mocking up a building. We had to do all of that stuff. For, for myself, I know how to do that as a scientist because my parents, you know, did these kinds of things. So I this is not unusual to me. But I realized there were a lot of stuff not built into my budget. And so, and of course, we hired Matt Norman, which was an undergraduate learning how to do these kind of document documentaries um, to help us film the process, which is another part of the dissemination of the work for the National Science Foundation. So here's um, Matt and Angela looking at the initial test pieces of this. So Angela spent time figuring out the font and the spacing of um, the DNA code and we decided to, to make it simple and we would use 16 and 18S ribosomal RNA from different model organisms that are primarily used on our campus. Um, the other effect that she was trying to get at was trying to create a complementary piece of DNA with light. And so we were trying to teach students that light is important um, for science, not only to visualize things, um, but optics and the physics side of science so that we wanted to include all of that stuff. So a lot of things go into the thought of this whole process. And there was a lot of trial and error um, here. Um, and so this is what it ended up looking at. Certainly not what that beautiful picture is. It would have been nice to do the circles. It turns out the circle glass was very, very expensive to do and the circle mirrors are even more expensive. So what you're looking at here is the sandplastic genome, it's inverted on the back and it's mounted on glass that's mounted on top. There's a spacer here on top of glass. So here's, here's um, cerevisiae and there's fun, fungi and then we have humans and then we have C. elegans, drosophila, what have you. And they're in the order in which they're related on the phylogenetic tree too. So we're also wanna teach evolution and relatedness. And so um, it's much better in person. And, and I'm gonna zoom in about the effect of the reflections. So what we figured out and we also had to pay for is the lighting here. And so the, what you're reading here is actually the reflection. And so this is the genetic reflection, um, but it also is teaching complementary complementary of DNA strands. And so your reading here is the, is the reflection um, from the light off the etch piece of that we etched here. And so um, my friend Alejandro took a, pic a great picture of me. And what you could see here, you can kind of see the complementary strands here from the reflection. And the reflection is also the reflection of you as the person, the child, the student, the public, looking into the mirror, seeing the DNA inside of you. So that idea is that this is inside of you um, and you're interacting it. Um, and it, so the fact that the piece is very interactive, this is the effect that we kind of wanted to do. This all comes from light optics, understanding the mounts and stuff. So a lot of thought goes into this. Angela and I ended up winning the most innovative art piece in the city um, for this, this um, Madison Awards for the arts. So that was quite an honor, especially for Angela to come up with this very innovative communication, communication of science piece um, that we have in the building. And so I, I have a two minute, or oh, I've shortened the movie up here uh, about, um, we're interviewing some of the teaching um, people who are in this bio track that, that this has made an impact for their outreach. Um, and so we're, I'll show you this video and certainly we could talk about all of these videos at the end of my um, talk here. And Public art is important in this building in particular because it gives our visitors a chance to see ideas that otherwise they might not be able to see. So a lot of things in science you can't see visually with the naked eye. Like if you ask students to see DNA with the naked eye, they say no, but then here you are, you're literally walking by. So take something abstract, it makes it concrete. I run with Tom Zinnin, the teaching lab, 
So we have K through 12 kids come in um, and we run workshops with them specifically DNA based. We start them at the phone and we discuss that, um, that macromolecule in the shape of it and how it runs. And then as we walk down the hall, we talk about those letters, especially if you have like little kids, they're like, wait a second, this is the four letters that we just talked about. And like some of them will like literally like stop and they'll like, they'll read <laughs> for 30 seconds. They'll like read out loud <laughs> the letters and they're like, huh. So to make like that direct connection, the, the fact that they can interact with it so closely, I think is a really big deal with this other thing. There's also cool things like use if you don't have the light on it. You can't really read the names of the model electrons. And so they start getting the idea that lighting matters not only in art, but in things like microscopy and how we try to see things in the life sciences as well as in the arts. So there's the cool movie of that. And I think both um, Tom kind of explained that kind of well, is that that idea of the light path and showing the reflection is really important part of that piece. And so um, part of the grant also went into this traveling piece. And so Angela found actually some mirrors that we could etch, not all mirror co compounds you can um, etch. And so this was kind of a more simple thing, even though we have about it's about, a, I think, a five or six foot uh, crate in my lab. It's take up a whole lab space where a lot of these are. So we have a whole, I think, 10 or 15 panels of this. So similar idea. And this, this was one of our first traveling places at Lawrence University, which is in Wisconsin. And so Angela and I went up um, to Lawrence and I gave a science talk, art talk, and she gave also an art workshop. And she also did a silk screening students are able to do silk screens of, of the sequences and the model organisms as a little takeaway. So it's kind of a little gift. So we kind of, we're kind of double teaming this and we're continuing to do it. And we have, we, I have Google interested in having this on Google campus. And so um, we, certainly if you know anyone who's interested in, in the traveling piece, we, we do this kind of thing, but also the really important part is having both the artists and the scientists come together to talk about this with students and to show that uh, both of us are required, art and science are really required for um, innovation in both fields. And so to disseminate this further, it dawned on me as like we were going to do a website and document this stuff. And we thought, well, it's great. So my two undergrads, Alif and Caitlin, all my undergrads and most of my students, even my grad students coming, they both have a real passion in art. And Alif and Caitlin have a certificate in the arts. And I said, why don't we do a coloring book? And so um, Alif drew this beautiful uh, cover of the coloring book here. And you can certainly purchase this on Amazon and Blurb. The digital versions on Blurb, you can buy the, the actual one on Amazon. And so we decided we would disseminate this whole project further to bring all that stuff that we see in that piece into an ABC coloring book of genetics. And it turned out there hadn't been kind of a K through 12 genetic coloring book or anything about model organisms before. We did a little research and there wasn't really anything. And so here's Alif and Caitlin, my amazing undergrads, they've since graduated now. Alif is really interested in going to medical school and Caitlin's really interested in working for the WHO or, or CDC. And I think in conversations with them, um, what they learned from this and they got credit, they got a whole year of credit. I also want to make just to reinforce it part of the NSF too that I make sure is all my students are getting credit and they learn through my mentorship how to communicate science in different ways. So I'm in the life science communication department. They got six year, the whole year of credit, six credits worth of communicating science. And this is the outcome of that. And they also have it in the resume, certainly that they, they have done a book. And I think in, in conversations with Alif, for example, being a doctor, she's understood is that learning to communicate really quickly and simply with visuals is, you know, helped her. To, she knows that's going to be important in her career. And so she sees it much, much so better after having this color book. And, you know, I think she's going to take that for the rest of her career and think about these things. And I think she's really interested also in kind of art therapy and thinking about these, these ways to use art also in medicine. Um, I will show you some pictures of, of what they've drawn. So you'll see there's different types of drawings. You can kind of attribute them to Caitlin or a leaf. This is actually a Caitlin, so A for Rabidopsis. 
This is a leaf, Daniel Rario, and F is for fruit flower. This is an a leaf. Uh, this is an a leaf, and what I like about the nucleus, she kind of adds her own kind of little motifs to it. And throughout the coloring book, there's little motifs throughout that you kind of have to find that keeps it kind of thematically the same. P, P is for phylogeny, and so here's all the model organisms that are in that original piece I showed you with her little motifs. Um, B is for virus, so right around the time we were about to publish, coronavirus showed up, so we, we changed. Instead of V for vector, we added virus in here. Um, and so, and then here's Caitlin's beautiful uh, corn, her Zia maze that she drew. Um, and probably one of the most important, what we really like to see is our fans. So we have lots of young children who are now coloring in the book, sending pictures of them um, and uh, getting all excited about learning about genetics and model organisms. Um, and with that, I will take questions and anything you wanna ask me, even if it's about my career or how do I approach this? How do I write this into a grant? I'm certainly happy and um, to talk about it. I'm also a consult on a lot of people's NSF broader impacts about how to do these kinds of things or help. How do you find a grad student, art student interested in helping you? Certainly can help you do that as well. So happy to take your questions and thank you yeah. for coming. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was just so full of information and I was just so amazed at, at all that beautiful, beautiful work. Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I just figured that uh, the Q and A is uh, function is not working. So please uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat, and uh, we we can have a little Q and A uh, session going here. All right, and we have a question. I absolutely have a question about. So Sarah said I I have a question about how to even get started. I think a lot about how to represent my data a gravitational way, in a tangible way but I have no clue how to get in touch with artists. So I get this a lot from scientists. How do I talk to an artist, right? So depending on where you are, Sarah, certainly you could reach out to the art department. They can say, do you have any grad students? That's one way. I am trying to assemble a bank of artists really interested in talking with scientists. So you can certainly contact me. I might be able to find, it depends on what type of art you want to do, right? Um, I have connection with, I'm working now with a ceramicist in Oakland. She's trying to find, she wants to work on oceanography and I'm trying to help her craft an email to a scientist to collaborate. So I can help you do that. I might know artists that might be able to represent gravitational waves. So certainly can help you with that. The best place is to have someone close and near to you that you can actually talk with each other. And I think show mock-ups of the work. And so that does work, but certainly you can have someone that is far away too that works. So I mean, now with Zoom, you can kind of do it, but still I think having someone close, the, the other part of it is you have to learn a different language an art language of talking about. I know how to communicate with that just because of my background, but I can certainly help to do that. But you're gonna have to organically have a conversation and become comfortable with each other because you're working in different fields and mediums and different things and they don't understand everything but you wanna articulate gravitational waves, for example, right? So you have to give them the most simplest thing. What do you want? What is the impact you wanna make? Um, what do you wanna communicate? Or do you want it inspired by your work, your gravitational waves, for example? So it has to be very clear and it will probably go through multiple kind of reiterations. And so just be prepared for that. What I would say, another way to get started if you're a little nervous about this is get in touch with a couple people. And if it's someone you like, or you kind of feel a good feeling, go to lunch once a month. So I have a dancer who's interested in dancing the dance of cell division. So we've been talking for like a year. We go to lunch, we become good friends of this. And so I'm learning her language because dance is so foreign to me. It, uh, just what she has to do. And so she's also busy and doing her other projects. So what I just from talking with her and having a meal with her, I was like, oh, okay. And now I get what she, what her dance and what she's famous for and what she's going to do. And so then I know how to go, okay, this is the science I need to give her because I understand her better. And so it is a process and it takes a bit of time. So if you're going to write an NSF grant, start a, a year earlier of these kind of things, several months, and you can kind of get a mock-up and an idea there. But I think Happy to help you, Sarah, and I'm glad that you're thinking this way and getting excited about it. Um, but it is a process and it takes a little bit of time. I am, 
I'm consulting on another NSF grant about plant uh, root uh, gravitropism. And it's something I kind of have to learn my own self, but I help the artist work with the medium. I say, okay, this is what you need to communicate. And then the PI is my colleague. And then I work with that artist. And so I, I'm kind of the speed bump person that helps with problems that artists might have because the scientists are certainly a busy person and I can kind of solve that problem easy. So I do that as well. Um, I just have to be pulled in on part of the grant is too. So great question though. Um, Daniel, you, your question was, I'm always nervous to add some of my ideas into broader impacts of NSF because they seem high risk or expensive. Would you talk a, a bit about more about how you couch some of your non-traditional psychom ideas? So I think about these for a long time. And I actually have a little, I have a little note. I have just this little notepad that I have of like, oh my God, that would be a cool idea for my next grant. And I kind of do research on it and they're very complex. I look for gaps, gaps in SciComm that have never been done, groups that have never been um, added to there. Cause I read, I review a lot of NSF grants myself. So I see what's coming in and I kind of go, okay, that, that's totally a new thing. And the collaboration with a very unique artist is something I do. So I kind of draft ideas and I think about it a little bit. And I also, you know, I kind of, I do want to communicate my art, but I do it, you know, abstractly. I also often times if I'm stuck with, if I think it will go, I talk to my program officer. He's now since retired, but the new one knows what I do and very supportive. And so I say, hey, I have this idea. Um, what do you think? And he helps me craft the sentence that the NSF requires, it needs to be traveling, all of these things. And then I, I usually, I sent that image, is this image work? And he says, yes. So I, there's a lot of back and forth to make sure that I know it's gonna be covered. Certainly 50,000 is not that much when you're gonna to start to pay someone's salary. Um, but my artist's salary was four months of work for her. And that had to include, you know, certainly, um, her healthcare and, and even insurance for her to be in the building. So there are a lot of expense that I didn't know that was gonna be there. So it takes a lot of work and back and forth. If you have a really good program officer that's willing to help, um, you know, have a rough draft. I mean, this is only a page and a half for me in my grant. So it's not that long, but the imagery is really important. I think for the scientists on the other side to see what you're doing and is that innovative and what groups are going to, you going to impact, you know, with this idea, right? So I would say that the, the, the more times you have a rough draft or you show it to other people and you show it to your program officer, I think you'll, they'll actually guide you there. Cause there are other people doing art stuff that are submitting NSF grants. It's just that there are certain requirements that they require at the NSF to do these. And so I think running it past them is a really good idea. And I think they're very helpful. I mean, I, I've made a lot of mistakes from my early career. I didn't put money in the, you know, I didn't even know you could put a budget for that in there. And that's on top of the science budget that's required. So it's actually an addition. So I didn't know that. And finally they're like, why aren't you doing this? And so I wish I would have known that e earlier myself. So, but it's a good question. I'm happy to help you though, too, as well. Um, Stephanie has, it's difficult to mentor art students within your lab in terms of the degree. No, not at all, because I have a degree myself and my parents. And so I know what's required of them. I also know the business of art. I know all of these requirements. And so for me, it's, they're part of lab meeting. It's just like a science student in some ways, but they, um, through the art department, they're the art, the artists who are overseeing the grades that come through there. They know what I'm doing and we, we talk back and forth and those kinds of things. So um, I, I don't usually recruit. I get tons of emails. I love science and art. So I have students constantly contact me. I have one right now that begged me. She came to my doors like, Milo, I want to be with you. And then so this is, you will find that you'll have tons of students like this, but I have students, I, I'd say five or six students a semester. I love art. I love science. I do have anything. I know you're one of the only people on campus that does this. So I, if it's someone that I see is very passionate that melds with, if I have time, I will mentor them in the art department. Um, I also, they also get a genetics credit too as well because um, it's my time mentoring them. Um, and I, and certainly the art department, the life science communication department, the 
the coloring book was a mentorship there. I have to go through their programmatic things and the program helps me mentor the students. You know, usually it's usually forms for an independent study to show what they're doing. And I have to write, you know, what did they do this semester? And here's the outcome and that kind of thing. So it's not as hard as you think. It's just, you go to those programs and see what is what independent study and you become a mentor and it, it goes from there. Um, it's just, again, it's probably another, couple more pieces of paperwork than you're normally used to. Um, if you're uncomfortable with it, you can find an artist that works in public that does, uh, most artists do a lot of public work. And so if you have an artist that you're familiar with, they can help mentor that student with you or if that's the artist you're collaborating with. So um, yeah, anyway, it's a good question. It, it is hard, it seems daunting at first, but it's easier than you think. It's just like any independent study in your lab. Sarah says, thank you for a wonderful talk. Is there any, um, am I missing something here? Okay, what's the next one? Let's see, Jennifer, right? I wanna say thank you talk. I've been working on coming up with ideas for science comm and education, give me a lot of inspiration. Great, thank you. Daniel says, thanks for the advice. So awesome. Any other questions? I'm happy to look at anyone's proposal. I'm happy to help one. I would love more people doing this. I really wanna, there is a whole group of young students up and coming. They all really wanna do these things. Open your labs up to doing these things and you'll see that they'll kind of come in, in droves actually, because I just, I can't keep up with it because there's so many, but I also see so many students, they get, torn between fields and I tell them that you don't have to do that and I think that's why I love doing it is because I see I don't lose those students to science they're very creative but my student now Gabby remarkable and she she's in biological systems engineering she wants to do kind of agricultural engineering but she's working with me on helping another scientist communicate work and it's been really remarkable to see her and she kind of said to me the other day she's like I said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she's like, well, I, I see you and I want to be like you because I want to do art and science together with my job. And so that's a great impact is that I see that I, they, they're not scared away from, you know, being an academia or in science and they, they see it as a value. And I think for me, my own personal experience is that I found a good job that I can do both of these things. And the National Science Foundation is really essential for allowing me to make impacts in the public about science and, and knowing that creativity is a really important part of the whole process of science. And I think if I didn't discover the NSF or discover this whole thing, I wouldn't be in, I probably would have dropped out a long time ago is because it's who I am as a person. When I see someone like Gabby, my new student, I see her the same thing. And I, I get really excited about that. And I, I, and I know a lot of students fall off in science because they don't have these kinds of experience. And so I'm always like, okay, I'll drop what I'm doing. I see potential here and I will, I'll come up with a project we can do you know, with someone else. And so I, I really love doing it. It's another part of my life that it just keeps me sane in science and it's really fun. Um, and it's also equally fun to see young kids really excited about the coloring book now and something tangible. And to, we talk about art and I, I have this background here because we do a lot of outreach with the Girl Scouts more recently in Wisconsin, virtual um, with the coloring book. And we talk about genetics and the coloring book and we have this little workshop. So if you go to my lab's website, um, we have a workshop on the coloring book. That is also published material from for the NSF. So if you go to lab website, you'll see this virtual workshop. And I put that URL into my progress report for the NSF. So that's also disseminated material. So even if you just make a website, so um, it's been really fun and it's just, I think it's a great way to get your work or your visual, whatever you visualize out into the public really easy and you can train students at the same time, so. Looks like we have one more question and then we will start wrapping up here uh, from Sarah. Yep, Sarah, so measurable in numbers, yeah. So, so the, the quantify the numbers. So NSF doesn't normally do kind of bean counting on the numbers, but I do, I do give them numbers of engagements on the website. So if you have your website and a counter, you can put those numbers, how many engagements. The other thing we, I take 
note of is how many, how many students we do in our workshops, right? How many books did I sell? We did that, um, those things. And so those are kind of impacts there. And they're ongoing. They know even past the grant that those are ongoing. So website, I always create a website. All, my website has all my science art. So on that page, it's only that project. So we can take, we have that measurement there. And then we take numbers from all of our events. So we kind of add all that kind of stuff, but they, they don't, I, they know that these are ongoing events. So that it's not like a finalized number. You get a rough number of like from what month to one month that you had this up that you kind of had those things. So, so those are the kind of things I do keep and we put down in there. But it's a great question. There's other ways you can do it. I, I'd have to say, um, Sarah, that you could have a survey on your website. We haven't done it like, what did you think about before you came here and after? So I'm doing that for another outreach project I'm doing. And so, um, so there's ways to do assessment like that. Uh, also art opening, we have, for example, we had 150 people had never been in a, a science building before we had that. That was that video of the first video. That was that art opening. And so that, that was submitted to NSF, you know, 150 people never seen images like, like that before for that one event, but certainly it's been ongoing and it's installed and hundreds of people come through there now. Um, right, so, so there's, it's enormous amount and the NSF certainly knows it's an enormous amount uh, of people. And so, yeah, you just have to figure out that assessment part and figuring out how you're gonna do it and count it. Um, but certainly website engagements are an easy one as long as you have it up there. That's why I put all of it up on my website for that reason. And it's easy and then I have to think about it. Thank you, everyone, I appreciate it. Thank you, Sockness, for hosting me. And it's an honor for, for all of you to be here today. And certainly, I guess I will put my in the chat if you're, if you're really interested. I'm the only Onoscope in the world. So you certainly you can email me um, and let me know if you want help and I'll help you um, read your NSF grants or if you have ideas, pass it by me, happy to help. Any, any time for any Sakhnisas, so happy to help you. That's great, thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you everyone for taking time and joining us today. Um, and of course, thank you Anna for taking your time and sharing this wonderful information. Wow, I've learned so much and it's just been amazing. We will have a recording of this presentation available probably in uh, two weeks. And so um, for uh, everyone that signed up, they will be alerted and notified that this uh, webinar is available for viewing and you can share it with others as well um, who may have missed this wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple other things just to wrap up, um, immediately following this webinar, you're going to get a survey. Uh, we ask that you please you know, take the survey, let us know what you think and if there's other ideas on, on what you would like to see uh, for us to coordinate, we're more than happy. You definitely can, can reach out and, and let us know. Um, and again, if you're interested in viewing more of the webinars that SACNIS has uh, put together, we ask that you visit our website, sacnis.org backslash webinars. We have a huge library of webinars that we've held over the past year and, and uh, that information is free and available to all of our SACNIS uh, members. So uh, remember that. And again, thank you, Anna, for, for taking time. This was, again was wonderful, um, really great information sh uh, to share. And for everyone, please have a wonderful uh, rest of your day and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.